Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you all this wonderful, beautiful morning. Yes, come on in and grab a seat. Um, if you would, open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke chapter 17. Is this sounding okay, Rob? Are we good? Uh, Luke chapter 17. There's only one place to mark in your Bibles this morning, and that's 2 Kings 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. Please raise your hand, and we can make sure that we get one to you. And um, it's very important that you follow along with us. I want to say welcome to all of you who are watching live online. I know that we had some issues last week of syncing issues. And, you know, I would move this way, but my mouth wasn't moving or something. You know, I know it's like a bad Japanese, old Japanese movie or something. But um, hopefully we have that fixed now. It looks like it's running well. So good, good. Anyhow, so just want to welcome all of you and uh, pray that you guys are blessed this morning. We're picking up in Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. Are you ready? It says in verse 11, Now it happened as he, that is Jesus, went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. We're going to stop there for a moment. The title of today's message is A Journey of Healing. A Journey of Healing. Every journey of healing begins with Jesus doing what we see uh, him doing right here described in Luke chapter 17 that as he's traveling the countryside seeking and saving those who are lost. We saw this back in Luke chapter 13 when it says that Jesus was going through the cities and the villages teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. So the Lord is, of course, he's been traveling his whole public ministry. He's been doing this from the very beginning. And he's doing it now. But what makes this journey different from all of the other journeys is that Jesus is now, at this point of his life, headed to Jerusalem for one reason, everyone, and that's to die. That is to hang on a cross and to die. And he's not going to make it out of there the way that we think he's going to make it out of there, right? He's not going to make it out alive. He's going to make it out of there resurrected which is going to be awesome. But all I could think of when I realize that this is happening, when I'm reading this, is, you know, what would I do if I knew that my life was coming to an end, say, in three to six months from now? And, you know, and then I thought, well, that's kind of a fallacy because, you know, we're all going to die, right? And so there's no guarantee that tomorrow's not guaranteed to us. So I have to re-ask the question, reposit the question. So in my false sense of security... Right? I wonder how I would live my life if I knew that I was going to die in three or six months. So Jesus spends the last days of his journey going from town to town, village to village, looking for people who are lost. And I just, I mean, I'm just being honest with you. If I knew I was going to pass away in three months, I don't know that I would be out traveling very much. I'd probably stay at home, stay near my family and my loved ones. And maybe that's just me. But listen, the Lord, obviously, he knows what's going on, and he knows that he has a mission to do. So what do we see here? We see that Jesus is the Savior who seeks. He is still, even now today, the Savior who seeks. And how does he do that? Well, we all know that he's not here physically, but he sent his Holy Spirit to be with us, as he told the disciples he was going to do in John chapter 16. He told them, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, then the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And so much like we see Jesus doing here in Luke 17 and 13, the Spirit of God will also do the same thing. He'll come to a place. He'll come to a town. He'll come to a church. He'll come to a person when they least expect him. God will find us in the darkest of places, and he'll find us in the, in the, in the, even in a church. Right? He'll come unannounced. In fact, Jesus reveals this very aspect of the Holy Spirit to the religious leader, Nicodemus, when he says to him not to marvel. He said, I say to you, you mu that you must be born again because the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it but cannot tell 
where it is coming from or where it goes, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And so the Lord is still on the move, seeking and saving those who are lost. And this becomes another lesson for us as we're looking at the scripture, as we're praying, as we're asking, Lord, how does this apply to us? What do you want us to gain from this? This becomes another lesson, another example for us to see, for us to learn, that just as God, from the very beginning, searched for Adam in the cool of the day, that he is still searching at this very moment for man right now. Jesus told us that, that God is actively looking for people to worship him. And he's doing that out there in the streets. He's doing that out there in the bars. He's doing that out there in the casinos. He's doing that out there on the beaches. And he's doing that in church. God is the creator. Man is his creation. God is the initiator. Jesus is the Savior who seeks. Man is the responder. It is not God who is hiding from man. It is man who hides from God. Jesus is the Savior who seeks those who are lost. And so here now, we see the Lord encounter come upon not just those who are lost, but those who are the outcasts, the very outcasts of society. Look at verse 12. It says, And then he entered a certain village, and there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. Now, if you remember, the first uh, ministry encounter that the disciples had that Luke records after Jesus called them to follow him, called them into discipleship in Luke chapter 5. And I just want to say, if you want to just thumb back to Luke 5 and just kind of have them both, 17 and 5, and you can reference back and forth for your own viewing pleasure, that would probably not be a bad idea. But the first thing that they encountered after the, the Lord called them into discipleship that Luke records was the healing of a leper. That's back in Luke chapter 5. And so here it is now, say some two and a half years, close to three years later, and they're encountering now a whole group of them. And so again, as we look at the scripture and I say, Lord, how does this apply to us? You know, does this have any meaning to me whatsoever? Here's what I believe the Lord has shown me and has given to us this morning. We can see that just as these 10 men had a common disease, so mankind has a common disease. It may not be a disease of the flesh, but it's certainly a disease of the soul. It's a disease of our spirit. It's our sinful nature. And the Spirit teaches us through the apostle that sin entered the world and death then by sin, and therefore it spread to all men because all have sinned. So sin, man's common disease causes man to stand afar off from a holy God. Causes man to stand just as these uh, men that had leprosy stood afar off from Jesus. Remember, leprosy becomes a really good picture of, of sin because they have a lot of the same characteristics Right? Sin like leprosy, it's a breakdown of something internal long before it is shown on the outside. Sin like leprosy, it numbs. It damages the, the mechanism that tells you that something is wrong. So with leprosy, it's your nervous system. With sin, it's your conscience. Sin like leprosy causes separation. It causes separation. The prophet, the Lord says to the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 59 that our iniquities have separated us from our God and that your sins, our sins have hidden his face from mankind so that he will not hear. And so we see, what are these men doing? Listen, they're doing what we've been engaged in and what we're engaged in now, which is socially distancing themselves from the Savior, and more than likely from everyone in their community. And so I would say if we are learning anything from this coronavirus, may we see how it too is a picture of sin. It is a picture of sin. How so? It has caused the whole world to be separated from one another. It's even caused the church at large to be separated from 
each other. And so we have to be careful, right? We have to be really, really careful, listen now, of what the enemy can do to us when we're separated from one another. The Spirit warns us in Proverbs chapter 18 that a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. Listen, that is a great scripture to have in your memory banks. It is a great scripture for the Lord to impress upon your heart, to impress upon us that oh, a, a person who isolates himself or herself seeks their own desire and rages, not just debates or argues, but rages against all wise judgment. And so we have to take heed to ourselves, not to allow this separation to cause us to decline into a place of isolation where the enemy can have a heyday. He can just have his way in a way that he can't when we're together. If the enemy can isolate you, he can lie to you. Now, certainly he can lie to you anytime, but when you're by yourself, it's like a flood. It's a flood of lies. And it's very hard to fight it. If the enemy can isolate us, he can deceive us. If the enemy can isolate us, he can cause us to live in evil suspicion of one another and cause us to live in fear of each other. We are weaker when we are separated from each other, for sure. When the body is disjointed, it cannot fight as well as when we are together. And so may the Lord give us a mind to discern and the eyes to see the similarities between sin and these diseases as well as to see the wicked schemes of the enemy. And so very interesting what the Lord does next. Look at verse 13. It says, And they lifted up their voices and they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And so when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priests. So again, if you have chapter 5 kind of you know, held with your hand, just look back there. In Luke chapter 5, what did Jesus do with this man that had leprosy? Listen, he healed him immediately. Immediately. The leper back in chapter 5, when he saw the Lord Jesus, says he, he fell on his face and he implored the Lord. He said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And it says in the very, very next verse, to the amazement of the new disciples, that Jesus then put out his hand and he touched the leper. He touched the man with the, with the virus, touched the man with the disease. And he said, I am willing be cleansed. And it says immediately, immediately the leprosy left him. But listen, here in Luke chapter 17, Jesus did not immediately heal these men. Why? Why didn't he immediately heal them? And here's what I want to suggest to you. Because I believe that to the Lord, you know, for us, it is important that we get you know, what we want from the Lord is very important to us, isn't it? Lord, I just want this thing. I want you to give me this, this particular thing that I want. But listen, what's as equally important to the Lord, maybe even more so, is what we learn. That what he is able to mold and shape in us through this process is just as important, if not more, than the very thing that we're asking for. Even if it's something to this extent of a, of a physical healing, because listen, as physical as it is now, it's only temporal. There is an eternal character that the Lord is interested in every single one of us. It's just like our children. They want to come up. They come up and they ask us for things, you know, certain things. They want money for, you know, something. And, you know, you have a choice. You can either just lay a whole bunch of money on them or you can help them to learn how to work which is a very good characteristic because they're going to need that, right? We come to the Lord, we say, Lord, we want this thing. And the Lord is like, okay, here's what we're going to do. They come to Jesus and they say, Master, Jesus, have mercy on us. And Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest. Now remember the, the Levitical law in Leviticus chapter 14, it required a person to be examined by a priest and to go through a very interesting process 
in order to reintroduce them back into the, the community. And I want to say the implication here uh, for, is that these men, that they've been together, they've been together for some time now. They probably know each other to a, a pretty good extent. I, I'm certain that they've commiserated with one another, sharing their tragic stories with one another. And, and more than likely, they probably have been looking out for each other. They obviously heard that Jesus was coming to town. And so they decided to go see him together in the hopes, of course, that Jesus would heal them. But now they're faced with a decision. What's the decision? They're faced with the decision. Do we stay here or do we go to the priest like Jesus said? Why do I bring that up? Why do I even posit that? Why do I say that? Because, listen now, they're not healed. All Jesus said was, go show yourself to the priest. But they're not healed yet. So why would they go show themselves to the priest? And this reminded me, uh, you know, this could very end up being like the, the, the Naaman story, right? The, the Syrian general back in 2 Kings. If you have 2 Kings, Mark, turn to 2 Kings chapter 5. Do you remember his story? Naaman, we've read this before. But he had leprosy. Remember, he came to the prophet Elisha's house to be healed. He came in all of his pomp and circumstance to Elisha's house. And do you remember what happened? Elisha didn't even greet him. He sent his messenger to speak to him when he came to the door. And picking up in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 10, it says... Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and you shall be clean. And look what it says in verse 11. Naaman became furious and he went away and said, well, indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the, the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Can I not wash in them and be clean? And so he turned and went away in a rage. Do you understand what's going on there? Right? He had this expectation of how this was all going to play out. And this was going to play out that he was going to come, and certainly Elisha was going to come and meet him. He was going to say, hey, it's so nice to meet you. Go through all the pleasantries. You know, didn't happen. So that's offense number one. The second thing that didn't happen was he didn't come and wave his hand over, you know, the whole the house or whatever and, and say these amazing words and then everything was going to be healed. So that was offense number two. And then he tells me to go dip in the Jordan? Are you kidding me? That's offense number three, right? He's like, forget it. This guy's an idiot. I'm not going to do it. And so what happens? Look at verse 13. The Syrians, uh, the general's servant came near. You've got to find that variation, came near. You know what that means? That means he, he kind of, I'm thinking, approached him very carefully. Came near and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more than when he says to you, wash and be clean? You know, this, this servant, the servant is a gift to this general, a gift from God to this general. He was not afraid to be a voice of reason. He was not afraid. He talked the general off of the ledge. Have you ever had anybody do that with you? And you're so angry and you're so upset and you have a friend or someone who just talks you off the ledge. This servant talked this general off of the ledge of his self-righteous anger. How? By speaking the truth. The servant wasn't afraid to speak the truth. But think about it. The servant put himself in a very dangerous place. Because if the general had been angry enough, he could have killed this servant. That would have been it. It would have been over for this guy. And so again, as we look at it and we say, Lord, is there any possible application in this for me? Lord, are you trying to show me anything in this? Is it possible? 
I want to say to you, we all have to watch ourselves and not become so angry that we act like a general. And we start blasting off, you know, things out of our anger, saying things that we should never say, that we should never even be thinking, you know, causing harm, hurting people, hurting, hurting innocent people, hurting people that should not be hurt. And this is where the prayer I think we need to pray the prayer of the psalmist. It's going to be up on the screen. Psalm 141. This is a beautiful prayer, everyone. You should write this verse down and, and, and just meditate upon it. He prays, Lord, set a guard over my mouth. Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. You ever pray that prayer? We should probably pray that prayer a lot more often. Lord, set a guard over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not let my heart be drawn to what is evil so that I take part in wicked deeds along with those who are e evildoers. Lord, don't even let me eat of their delicacies. Lord, I don't want, help me not to even want any part of that. Get the very next verse. Let a righteous man strike me that is a kindness. Let him rebuke me, and that is oil on my head. And my head will not refuse it. Oh, I pray this is our prayer. I pray that this, this is a place that we can get to where you, listen, you can come to me and you can rebuke me. You can say whatever you need to say to me, and I can receive it. It would be like oil to my soul, salve to my spirit. And listen, I can say the same to you, and we can say the same to one another. Not just, you know, there's a, there's a, there's certainly there's a love that covers a multitude of sins, but there are things that, that take place that happen where, Lord, put a guard over our mouths. Lord, help, help me not to even say such things. Lord, help me to see this time as a, as a time of healing. For my prayer will still be against the deeds of evildoers. So back in 2 Kings chapter uh, 5, verse 14, it says, So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And so just like Naaman, the choice for these 10 lepers is they can stay and remain or they can obey the Lord and see what happens. They can obey the Lord and see what happens. And so they decided then to take this journey and see what happens. And you know, when I saw that this week and I was looking at it, it made me think of my personal journey, my family's personal journey of coming out to Charleston because this is exactly what we went through. We took a journey to see what was going to happen. Lord, what was going to happen? And I remember saying to my family, I remember saying to my wife and to my kids, I even remember having this conversation with one of my relatives. Now, I, I would, this was the thing I would say all the time. I would say, look, we can stay in Denver and we can let life happen all around us. We can let life happen to us. Or we can go out where God is calling us and make life happen. The unknown is a very scary thing. But I'm here to tell you, God is in the journey. Growth is in the journey. Healing can be in the journey. And so do you know what this is? Listen, this is the call of God on these men's lives. This is the call of of God. Jesus is calling these men to step out in obedience and trust him. To trust him. The Lord is teaching these lepers. He's teaching his disciples. He's teaching all the disciples and whoever read this for the ages to come that healing and salvation, listen, come when we respond to God in obedience and with trust and in faith. This is the important lesson. This is what Jesus is wanting to work so deeply and make it so ingrained in these lepers and in these disciples. This is why Jesus, at least in part, didn't heal them immediately. He sent them on a journey to learn this lesson. 
Because even after they're healed, they're going to need this character within them. Because there's going to be another trial, and then another trial, and then another trial, and they're going to need to step out each time in obedience and in faith, trusting the Lord. David Goodson calls this putting on the new man, even though we still look and feel like the old man. Putting on the new man, even though we still look and feel, and maybe I would say even smell like the old man. Right, that we would come to that place where we would trust the Lord. Do you believe that God is is finished with you? Oh, I hope you don't. I hope you know that God has so much more that he wants to do with you and so much in store for you. And so can you step out in what he's asking you to do? Can you believe that God is who he says he is? Can you believe he's going to do a great work in your heart? Can you believe as as the the God who... who, um, The Spirit says to the apostle, gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, that he can do that very same thing in your life. And so we know now on the other side of the story that the Lord, he does have great things in store for these men. And listen, I believe the Lord has so much more in store for us here in Charleston. And what God wants to do, reaching people to disciple them. So they go out, And look what happens. Look at verse 15 back in Luke 17. It says, And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he returned with a loud loud voice, glorifying God. You understand? This is not, he didn't come back with a a somber, you know, reverent, uh, respectful, you know, voice. He came back with a loud voice, glorifying God. And he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was... A Samaritan. What does that mean? Well, you can look up the history of Samaritans and where they came from in 2 Kings chapter 17. I just don't have the time to go through all that. Suffice to say that the Samaritans were a people of mixed races. They had an eclectic religious system that included Judaism, right? Which did not make the Jewish... They, they, they were originally, you know, just the northern tribes of Israel. And then they got, you know, uh, carried away by the, nor- uh, by the king of uh, Assyria. Anyway, so the the southern Jews, they did not appreciate what uh, the Samaritans were doing, you know, taking their worship and and, um, continuing on with the sins of uh, Jeroboam. So they did not get along very well. So when the scripture points out that that the one who came back to thank Jesus was a Samaritan, understand this was a statement. This was, without stating it directly, it became a picture of, of where the nation of Israel was as a whole. Right, that the only one that would come back to the Lord was a Samaritan, someone who was not considered of the right family. These nine Jewish men were so focused on wanting to show, you know, the priest that they missed the Savior. They were so focused on wanting to show themselves to the wrong people that they missed the Savior entirely. And so the journey now, it becomes revealing, as it so often does. You know, I, was, I remember when we were coming out again, I was handed a two-volume set of Hudson Taylor. I'm telling you, it's a great, great book for anyone to read. It's a two-volume set of, his, of all of his letters that he had written to his family, to his sister. And I also had read, uh, at that time, other missionaries' journeys. And there was something that was very common in every single one of their journeys. Listen now. That people that left together, they didn't all make it. Not everyone made it. Why? Because the journey was revealing. It was very revealing of what was in their hearts. Because when we take a journey, understand what the Lord does? He tests us. Yeah, God tests us. Would God do that? Would God test me? Yes, God would test us. And I'm not just making that up. There's actual scripture that says this is what he does. He tests us in order to 
humble us. He tests us in order for us to see what is actually in our hearts. This is exactly what he did with the children of Israel coming from Egypt to the promised land. It says in Deuteronomy 8, to humble you, to test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Keep his commandments? What commandments? Well, that you would love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, that you would have no other gods before him, that you would love your neighbor as yourself. Let's just talk about the first two. Now, have you ever had people live with you? People staying with you? Right? I'm not talking about your immediate family. I'm talking about you know, extended family. They come and they stay with you for a while. Maybe they're moving here, or maybe you went and stayed. Even on vacations, you know what it's like? You go stay with family on a vacation, and you're there for you know, 10 days, and by the end of that 10 days, you're like, oh, it's time to go. Right? right? It's, just, it's just this thing that, can you imagine? They tr- there's how many of them? There's close to 2 million leaving Egypt, and all the stuff they had to bring, and all the people that there were, that they traveled through, the, you know, the, what they had to travel, what they had to go through, getting on one another's nerves to test you, to humble you, to see if you could still love one another. Traveling through the desert and that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. So there's four things that the Lord says, that, that Moses is saying right here, that the Lord did in this test. Number one, it was to humble them. Number two, it was to see what was in their heart, for them to see what was in their heart. Number three, it was to see if they would keep his commandments. And number four, it was to help them to, to, to see you know, that, that they don't live by bread alone, but upon every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Would the Lord test me for that? I'm telling you he would. So I don't know what you think God is like or what kind of a person or character God is, but this is who he is. This is how he reveals himself in Scripture. So interesting, uh, uh, the ritual that a leper would have to go through as written in the Levitical law, right, that we looked at when we were uh, back in Luke chapter 5, it's a prophetic ritual, it's, it's a ritual that foretells the actual healing that God would provide in the future permanently through Jesus the Messiah. But as Warren Wiersbe says here, he said, instead of going to the priest, the Samaritan became a priest. And he built an altar at the feet of Jesus. The Samaritan, he humbled himself. The Lord sent them on a journey And who is passing this test? The Samaritan is passing the test. So he comes back and he humbles himself before the Lord and he worships him. And look what Jesus says in verse 17. Were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give God glory except this foreigner? And so question, let me ask you, who is he talking to? Who is Jesus talking to? Who is he you know, putting this question forth to? Samaritan, maybe? The disciples, maybe? I would say yes and yes. And anyone within the earshot of his voice. Let me ask you another question. Who is Jesus talking to now? Who is he speaking to now? He's talking to us, everyone. And it's my prayer that we hear and receive what Jesus is asking us and saying to us, listen, where are we? Where are you? Where are we? Are there any among us found who are going to give God glory? Who are going to come to him and give him glory? Or are we so busy trying to show ourselves, listen, to the wrong people? Or are we willing to come to Jesus, to the person that we belong to, to the God who saved our souls, and humble ourselves and fall on our faces before him and worship him? Listen, this is my prayer, that this is where we are. And maybe we've been showing ourselves to the wrong people. And listen, we need to not do that anymore. We need to come to the Lord and fall on our face before him. 
The Samaritan could care less about the priest. He wanted Christ. All he could think that to do was to come back to the Lord and fall before him and worship him. This man was not only changed on the outside, he was forever changed on the inside. Only, on, listen, only one, only one responded to the call. Only one passed the test in the journey. So what does Jesus say to him? Jesus says, listen, he says, arise. Arise. I think that's beautiful. He has come to the place where he needs to be, and now Jesus can say to him, arise. And go and grab hold of everything that is waiting for you now. Arise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Not only was this man made clean of his disease, he was declared saved by the Savior. Think about it. Which would you rather be? Declared clean by the priest or declared saved by the Lord? Every journey of healing begins with Jesus seeking after us, those who are lost or maybe those who have wandered off. And when he finds that person, and maybe that's you, maybe that's you, what is he going to do? What is he going to do? Will he send you on a journey? Would he test you? Would God humble you? For you to see what's actually in your heart, and how you're going to respond. And are you going to respond in anger because Jesus didn't answer you the way that you wanted him to? Well, Lord, this is not what I thought was going to happen. This is not how I saw this whole thing playing out, Lord. And so how long are you going to hold on to that? You're going to be angry at God? Or are you going to humble yourself Fall at his feet and worship him. How are you going to respond to God? How are you going to respond to the call? Because here's the thing. The Lord is willing. God is willing to, to heal anyone and everyone. God is willing to, uh, to send us all on a journey. That is not the issue. The issue is, what are we willing to receive from the Lord? What are we willing to hear about ourselves, not about other people, about ourselves. What am I willing to hear about myself? Am I going to like it? Probably not. Do I want to hear it? Probably not. Because we can sit there and rage about how wrong and how bad, listen now, if I can have your eyes, we can sit here and rage about how wrong and, and how bad everyone else is, but you know the question that we need to be asking is, Lord, what's my problem? And then when you ask, you have to be willing to hear it. And you have to be willing to receive it so that the Lord can affect change in us. Listen, the Lord wants to make you clean. I can stand here in 100% confidence and say the Lord wants to make you clean. He wants to declare that you are his child. Let's pray, Father.